All right. You guys have a great night last night? You guys ready? Let me see. I got two types of presentations I usually deliver. I got a boring one. I got an exciting one. Which one do you want? If you, if you thought boring, leave. All right. Before I give you my presentation, I need to make sure you're mentally ready because this takes time. Now, listen carefully. Free your hands. Like, put that candy bar down. Yeah. Right. Put your right hand. Give me the OK sign. Now, what I want you to do is go down the middle finger, ring finger, pinky finger, work that sucker back up. Did you have a problem with that? If you did, leave the room. Good. <laughs> Left hand. Same thing. Let's do it all over again, all the way down. Not a big deal. You know the deal. All right. Nationwide, do not fail me. Here comes the real test. With your right hand, give me the OK sign. With your left hand, put your thumb on your pinky finger. Listen carefully. Instructions are very important. Don't do anything till I count to three. At the count of three, what I simply want you to do is go down with one and up with the other. Not a big deal. Okay? Just go down with one. Didn't I say wait till I count to three? That's what I said, right? Okay. One, two, three, go. Oh, oh. Oh, 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 oh. Just stop. Stop. I'm seeing a room of grown adults going, uh, right? Now, by the way, it was, e it was easy to do with one hand because why? You've always done that, right? You count. One, two, three, four, five. But as soon as I asked you to do something different, was it a little difficult? Yes, you know. I'm going to give you some information today. And the question I want you to answer is, how could I use it? Because it may seem, when I give you the information, like, uh, I don't know if I can use that. But studies have shown that if you practice this for 30 days, what happens? It becomes a what? That comes with a warning, by the way. If you walk around Las Vegas going, eh, people will give you money, okay? Because <laughs> they'll think you're special, right? All right, so I'm going to give you a lot of information, and the only question I want you to ask yourself is, how can I apply this to my sales process? If I'm a manager, how could I apply it to influencing people to do the things I want them to do, okay? So don't just think in terms of sales. It's all about influence today. You with me? Yes? yes. Beautiful. Ebbinghaus has an interesting curve. Listen carefully. Did you know that you will forget 75% of what I say within 24 hours? How depressing is that? Within 30 days, you'll forget 90% of what I said. And the 10% that you do recall, 50% of that is incorrect. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep it simple so it'll uh, stick. By the way, interesting note. So when a client tells you, let me think about it and get back to you, Based on Ebbinghaus, are they really going to think about it? No. All right, so let's close them. By the way, who's here? Managers. You got managers? Raise your hand. Ooh, I got to be careful. All right. How many sales people do we have? Wonderful. My last category, I need you to be honest. This only works if you're honest. Raise your flags if this is you. How many know-it-alls do I have? Come on. Flag up. Flag up. <laughs> you know what I like? Every time I do that, you got people who look at the know it all going, dude, that's you. Raise your hand. Come on, come on. Raise your hand. That's you. Just raise your hand for all my know it alls By the way, by show of, hand, how many, show of hands, how many people have been in sales at least five years? Keep your hands up. Ten years. Keep your hands up. Fifteen. Twenty. Twenty-five. Thirty. Thirty-five. Lone survivor. How many years, sir? Thirty-eight. 38, give him a hand, folks. Give him a hand. 38, congratulations. Now, so I know when I come in a room like this that there's a lot of people in here who've been in sales a long time, such as yourself. In fact, you know a lot. You probably know more than I do. But let me ask you a question. If I can just show you one or two things that may help you improve your sales by a couple of percentage points, are you at least willing to listen? My 38ers, yes? My know-it-alls, yes? Give it to me verbally, yes or no? All right, here we go. Archimedes had an interesting principle. He said, give me a long enough pole and a place to stand, and I can move the world. What does that mean to us? We have clients who sometimes don't want to move, right? And our job is to grow our pole of influence to what? Leverage them so they can make a decision. You ever hear the owl think about it? Our job is to move them away from the status quo. Everybody with me? Yes? Beautiful. Here's influence, the definition of influence. The act of producing an effect without apparent exertion of force or direct command. Wow, I'm ADD. That doesn't work for me. How about this? Simple definition. The ability to guide a person's behavior or make them comply passively. Too Vader-like, right? Too Darth Vader-like. Let's move on. I don't like that either. How about this one? The ability to nudge and not push. Would you agree that today's client doesn't want to be pushed, right? But if we can what? 
nudge them. Just give me the nudge. Hey, nudge. Yeah, that's all we want to do. That's what you're going to learn today, how to nudge. Did you know? And I'll talk to you about nudging because you've been nudged. Today, you'll be nudged for the next day and so forth. Did you know, for example, when you walk into a store, they leave 10 feet of space? Because studies have shown consumers need that much time, space rather, 10 feet to decide before deciding which way to go. Did you also know that the majority of consumers, when they walk into a store, will go to the right, unless you're from across the pond, right? Then you'll go to the left. But if most people go to the right, that means the most valuable piece of real estate is always where? Off to the right when it comes to promoting a new product or service, right? Did you also know there's something called an interception rate? Do you ever walk into a store and somebody says, can I help you find something? Just asking that simple question increases sale by 30%. Wow. Are we impulse buyers? Yes or no? Say it loud. Yes or no? Where do they put the milk in the grocery store? Yell it out. All right. Whoever's the refrigerator, thank you for the obvious. <laughs> okay. They, they, they put it in the back. Why? They put the milk in the back. They, Bread, meat, they want you to walk through the store because on the way back you might see some cookies, you might see some donuts. We're impulse buyers. Did you know that consumers have a velocity? If you have a narrow aisle, you will walk faster. If you have a wider aisle, you will subconsciously slow down. Don't believe me? Next time you go to a big anchor store, go by the perfume section. Go by the ladies' shoes section, right? All, and all of a sudden it gets what? Wider. Interesting, right? So what happens is, what happens if you don't have the luxury of wide aisles, like a Walmart, for example? You walk through Walmart real quickly. How do they slow you down at Walmart? What do they use at Walmart to slow your pace down? <laughs> I don't even want to go there. <laughs> right? They have those bins in the middle. You ever see those bins in the middle? Those are like speed bumps, right? You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. 20 DVDs, five bucks. Maybe I should watch this, right? You get the idea? You ever notice that when there's no traffic, you'll drive slower? You ever notice that? Nobody's on the road, you'll drive slower. But as soon as there's a lot of traffic, you'll drive, what? Get all tense, right? And if you're a guy, you've got to get in front of that one car because it makes all the difference in the world, right? Right? Nonverbal behavior and expressions. By actually measuring nonverbals, guess what? Your close rate, by mimicking nonverbal behaviors, close rates go up in one study. Touching somebody's arm right down the elbow, right? Just touching somebody's elbow while explaining something actually increases sales. In this study from 50 to almost 80 percent. Think about that. Just touching the elbow. I didn't say fondle. I said touch. <laughs> okay. Let me ask you a question. So they got two jam displays. Day one they put one jam display has six flavors. Second day they put one that has 24 flavors. Which jam display sold more? Which one? Are you sure? I think you're right. 24, people who approached the 24 flavor display only bought, 3% bought. But on the 6, 30% bought. Why? Less choices. Remember, a confused mind will never make a decision. So we have to narrow down their choices. They did a study with waiters and waitresses. They wanted to find out if I mimic your order right back to you the way you told it to me, exactly, word for word, versus paraphrasing the order, which would be more effective? What they found out is that waiters and waitresses that mimicked word for word what you ordered right back at you, 70% more tips. Wow, isn't that cool? Yes, it is. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> good news or bad news? So if you've got to present some good news and bad news to a client, what should you do first? Good news, raise your hand. Present first. Bad news, raise your hand. Present first. Refuse to raise your hand. Raise your hand, okay? <laughs> the answer is, it depends. If you have a motivated buyer, give them the good news. And then at the end, give them the bad news, right? Just kind of follow it up, caboose it in, right? But you ever had that one skeptical buyer, the unmotivated skeptical, this person? What, right? And then you tell them, sir, we are more expensive. That's a given, but let me explain why. I'll stop right there. As soon as I tell a skeptic, an unmotivated buyer, that we are more expensive, but that depends on what you're buying, stop right there. What is the skeptic thinking? Think about it. What is he thinking? Well, that was honest. And then you come in with the good news. You have to believe me on this good news, bad news. You ever see those commercials on TV for different medication, right? My favorite one being Viagra, right? So you ever see that? There's the, the, my favorite one. I'm not making this up. 
My favorite one is the one where they show the lady, the wife, she's sitting on the porch knitting in the chair, right? Swinging chair with a smile on her face, right? And then they, they cut over to the dad, right? Oh, he's got a football, and he's throwing it through the tire hanging on the rope. Do I have to connect the metaphor for you? No, I don't, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, some of you are real slow in the morning. I just had to help you on that one. That was their meta. Look, don't look at me. That wasn't my commercial. Don't look at me like, well, so what happens is, Every time you hear these commercials, what happens? They give you all the great news about the medication, right? And at the end, what do they say? Please consult your doctor. You know, and then they go, blah, 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 and you're like, well, I don't understand. Again, they're talking to motivated buyers. Let me ask you a question. You're talking to a client, one-on-one, -on -one, one to a group, if you have the opportunity. What percentage of the time do you think the client is looking at you, making eye contact? What percentage of the time? Yell it out. Yell it out. Register. What percentage of the time do you the salesperson think you're looking at the actual client. Okay? Studies shown that clients are looking at you 75% of the time. Interesting. What's also interesting, if not more interesting, is that you're only looking at them 40% of the time. In this study, very interesting, it said that by just simply increasing your eye contact to 50% and above increases your credibility. Simple way of influencing people. Now, why does that work? Because people like to look you in the eye when they what, talk to you, make sure you're not avoiding them, evading. Get the idea? Facts tell, stories sell. We know this one, right? Let's move on. So I love this. This was a great uh, study that was done. Let me ask you a question. If you go to a restaurant, how much do you tip? Yell it out loud. Okay. I was in the other group. The other group said 5%. I was like, East Coast, right? So <laughs> how many folks from the East Coast? They were from the other coast. Yeah. <laughs> so, so typically you get 15%. This study was based on 15% tip, right? And they wanted to find out is could they influence the tip rate? So what they found out is if they give you one mint, will that actually increase the tip rate? Yes or no? Absolutely. 3.3% on a mint, which begs the question. If it worked with one minute, maybe we should try. Yeah. So they said, well, I wonder if it worked with two minutes. So this time they doubled down on the minutes. They put two minutes. Did it work? Amazing. 14.1 increase, two minutes, which begs the question. Maybe we should try. They tried three, and it didn't work. It didn't work. But something interesting, else, something else happened. Here's what they figured out. They figured out that the ultimate power tool to increasing tip, pay attention, is they did this. They come over, they give you the order, you've been great, great talking to you, hope you guys come back, right? And they give you a mint. And then the person pretends to walk away, stops, turns around and goes, you know, because I really like you guys, here's another mint. Do you think that little cheesy strategy worked? Yes or no? Bam! Yes, it did. 23%. Now, there's three reasons why it worked. Why? Give it to me. Yell it out. Three reasons why it worked. You felt special. It was personal. But the big one, the main ingredient, it was un... Yes, it was unexpected. You ever have somebody do something for you that's unexpected? You're like, wow, that was really nice. Right? It registers with you. You know, maybe send a thank you letter. Right? By the way, we can get back to thank you letters. I think so. Remember back in the day you got thank you letters, like whatever. And then, but you were excited when you got email. Remember that? Remember the day when you were excited to get email? You got mail. Boom. You've got mail. I'm like, yes, I've got mail. Yes. Today, what do you say? What do you say? Damn, I got mail. <laughs> so maybe we should swing it back the other way and write thank you. One of the things I used to always do is I used to give my customers books. Based on our conversations, I'd figure out what they'd like. And I just send them a book. Get the idea? It could be something small as a $5 gift card. Doesn't matter. Anything that is unexpected is impactful. Did you know that a client is more likely to say yes if they're sitting in a softer chair as opposed to a hard chair? Wow, the butt decides. Because when this goes numb, this goes what? Dumb, right? So you might want to look at your furniture arrangement in your office. Clipboard. So here's an interesting study. And again, what I'm demonstrating here is that we're being influenced all the time at a subconscious level. There's no pressuring or persuading going on. Interesting study. This group, I'm going to give you a resume. And I'm going to put that resume on a light clipboard. 
and I want everybody to review the resume individually of this candidate. And then what I want to do is tell me who would want to interview this candidate, and then I'm going to count out the total. With me? This group, same resume, exact same resume, no different. What I'm going to do is give it to you on a hard, heavier clipboard. Same thing, review the resume, count up how many people actually want to interview the candidate, and then let's see what we have. Which side will draw more interviews, the light clipboard or the heavy clipboard? Light or heavy? Okay. Some of you refuse to commit no matter what. No, Vic, I'm not committing. The answer is heavy. Interesting, because at a subconscious level, think about it. At a subconscious level, even the tactile feel of something heavy influences how you perceive something. Because in our brain, we have these rules of thumbs, heuristics. It's how we make decisions, rules of thumb. And when something gets heavy, it must be what? Quality, right? If it's light, it must be what? If it's inexpensive, it must be cheap. By the way, there's a long line in this restaurant. That must be a good restaurant. Wow, there's nobody in that restaurant. Ah, let's move on, right? That's how our brain thinks. Our customers are always making snap judgments, OK? Using visuals. How many folks use visuals in their presentations? OK? Let me ask you a question. Just randomly yell out. How many visuals do you think you have within the 30, 45 minute presentation that you give? Yell it out. Number of your visuals. One, okay, three, okay, somewhere now, okay, one to four range. All right, wonderful. When you use visuals, people are more likely to what? Buy, but they're also more likely to pay more, and they'll remember 75% more, right, as opposed to forgetting the majority. When you use visual, it's more impactful. We're visual creatures. We need to see the visuals, and we'll talk about this later. Here's an interesting, when I talk about visuals, I don't always mean like show graph hand them a prop, sometimes you can insert a visual image into somebody's head to influence them. Let me give you an example. So let's say I work for an energy efficiency company. And what I do is I walk into somebody's house, review their house, look at their windows, their doors, their air conditioning, their heater, and make some recommendations on where they can improve their energy efficiency. So what's your name? Tony. Tony. Pleasure to meet you, Tony. So I go to Tony's house, and what I do is after I do the inspection, I have a list of all the improvements Tony can make. Now, I have the information on what type of clipboard. Have your life. Good. All right, so I say something to Tony like this. Tony, I reviewed your house, and here are all the places I think you can improve on energy. What do you think? Right? What a great close, right? What do you think? And so when they did that, they only closed 15% of the deals. Right? As you would expect, right? Not a powerful close, right? Then they changed one thing. Listen carefully. Just one thing, just to show you. It's all about the conversation and the power of how you frame things. Did the same thing, walked through the house, came back, on a clipboard, had the list. Tony, here are all the improvements you can make. And then they said something like this. Tony, if you were to add up all these energy inefficiencies, that would be the equivalent of having a hole the size of a basketball in your wall. And Tony, if you had a hole that big, wouldn't you want to fix it? Right, see the framing? All of a sudden, bam, 61%. Just on phrasing. Because what did you see? What was the mental image that I put in Tony's head? A hole. But what was going through that hole? Yeah, you start seeing, oh my God, how much money am I losing? Because I now am selling the loss. And we'll get back to that. We have tendencies, would you agree? Biases, dispositions. Here are some conclusions. We're more susceptible to influence than we care to admit. The most influential people are the least obvious. Those are the people who come in stealth. Right? Right? Just, and then, rules of selling apply no matter what you're selling. Real influence apply no matter what you're selling. Are you with me? Are we all in sales, yes or no? Yes. Even as a manager, are you in sales? Yes. Yeah, because in your, you're selling the goal, an idea, a vision, the enthusiasm, right? That's what you do as a manager, right? You're selling all the time. We've been in sales since day one. I'll prove it to you. When you were a little baby, you were bawling. Bawling is just another form of selling. You're selling your mother on the idea that you're hungry. That was your first pitch. You just didn't know it. As you got older, you started begging. Mommy, can I have a cookie? That was your second sales pitch. Begging is just another form of what? Selling. As you got older, you started bargaining. Bargaining is just another form of what? Selling. If I wash the dog and clean the house, can I, can I, can I use the car this weekend? Remember that? Right? You get the idea? Ladies only. Remember when a guy comes up to you and says, how you doing? What's your name? Where are you from? What's he doing, ladies? Selling. That's called the building rapport phase, right? <laughs> then he tells you something like this. I work for this company. 
I drive a Mercedes. I have a house on the hill. Big numbers for a salary. I work for Nationwide 38 years. Good. <laughs> What's he doing, ladies? He's why? Selling. He's building credibility. Then he asks you, what type of music do you like? You say, well, I don't know. I like a little jazz. He goes, so do I. <laughs> right? Synchronization. And then he asks you, what type of movies do you like? You said, I like romantic comedy. He says, shut up. So do I. <laughs> Ladies, what is he doing? <laughs> Selling line. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas, let me ask you a question. Real simple. Please don't fail me on this one. You see a beautiful lady pass by, beautiful shoes, beautiful outfit, jewelry, makeup, hair did just right. What is she doing? No, that's marketing. Big difference. Keep that in mind. Big difference, okay? Women are marketers, right? <laughs> did I just lose half the women here? Just like, that's it, Victor. We're done with you. All right. By the way, real quick. Uh, I always ask, I put this here because I always want to ask, am I going too fast, too slow, or just right? Just right. I asked this question because uh, many years ago we used to live in Miami. And we lived in Miami, and I remember I moved up. Miami people talk, what? Real fast, right? And then we moved to Georgia. Anybody from Georgia, raise your hand. Right? Oh, good. Okay, one guy. Damn. Okay. <laughs> I'll just pretend he's not here. But then, I was talking real fast in Miami. When you get to Georgia, things begin to slow down quite a bit, Right? And I remember the first time I was selling, I was selling to this guy named Larry Ashton. Larry Ashton was a good old boy. Just, you know, big barrel, that guy. Good old boy. Whatever image you have, backwood, good old boy, that's him, right? Love that man. And so I remember the first time I met Larry, talking to him, talking to him, right? And I'm like, eh. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down, Victor, slow down. He said this, listen to you, I feel like a monkey making love to a skunk. <laughs> You ever have people say something to you that your brain, you can hear the gears grinding in your head? You're like, and I said to him, I go, what does that mean? Right? Without missing a beat, he says, man, I don't know if I had all I want, but I know I had all I can take. You know? <laughs> that was my introduction to Georgia. All right. Uh, take notes. We're going to have fun. By the way, by the way, uh, I believe you've got to have fun to actually deliver the information. Are you okay with that? Are we cool? Okay. Now, Real quick, I started looking at the world of selling. Started looking at the world of selling. And it's interesting because if you study selling, you'll find books, audio, under three categories. Strategy, how do you approach a market, right? Then you got tactics, face-to-face, belly-to-belly, one-on-one conversations we have with people, right? And the last part is the psychology of selling, right? Staying positive. If you go on Amazon, for example, there's over like 20,000 books on selling. 98% of all the books that you'll read are dedicated to what? How to sell. And this is great. And I started looking at this, and you've read some of these books. Remember this? How to Master the Art of Selling. Tom Hopkins, right? Back in the day. That great book, Spin Selling, Neil Rackham, how to ask good questions, right? Situation, problem, implication, need payoff, right? You learn that, so you learn how to ask great questions, solution selling. Maybe you're selling a big company, so you do that. Great book, How Winners Sell, Proven Strategy so you can win. You read that, you're like, ah, oh, I think I'm fired up now, Victor, right? Then you read The Psychology of Selling, what? Oh, Brian Tracy, ooh, I can sell today. Yes, yes, yes. I'm motivated. Then, my God, they have a sales Bible. Right? So you read the sales Bible, you feel enlightened, right? But then Gittimer comes out, after this great book, he comes out with this one. The Little Red Book of Selling, 12.5 Principles of Sales Greatness. So if you have a Bible, what does that make that? The New Testament. You're slow this morning, but that's okay. Right? Then you read Strategic Selling. So you go, okay, I think I got the Strategic Selling. So you, then they come out with the new Strategic Selling, so you read that. Then they come out with Conceptual Selling. Oh, okay, I got to learn that. Let me read that. So you read that. Then you read that. Get yeah, Selling Results. Get the idea. See you at the top, right? Investigative Selling. Got to ask the right questions. And we're also talking to the right person. Very important top officers. And if you're talking to a couple, who's in charge? The man or the wife? Don't even fight it, folks. Don't even fight it. It's the man. The wife. Cold calling, right? Techniques. Learn how to cold call. Sometimes it's a technical sales. So you read that and you think, okay, I think I got the sales thing down. And then you read major account selling. Hope is not a strategy. Six keys to winning the complex sale. So you think you understand the complex sale. But no, 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 wait, 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 wait. You got to know how to master the complex sale. So you read that, and oh, this is getting so technical. But then you're in the insurance business, so it's all about, uh, let's talk about customers. Relationship, customer intimacy, right? 
So you read relationship selling and you think you got it, but you don't. Because then you got to read the follow-up book, understanding what you just understood, right? <laughs> so you understand relationship selling. Then you go, okay, I think I got it. But then apparently there's an edge to this thing. I didn't know about it until I read the book. There's an edge to relationship selling. And for my know-it-alls, guess what? The official know-it-all guy, the relationship selling, right? <laughs> now, if all this is frustrating you at this point, you're thinking, no, 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 don't worry. That guy just said, you know what, let me boil it down to one minute, right? And this is when you think it's okay. He comes back and says, let's rethink the whole thing, and you're frustrated, right? You ever go to a sales training program? Don't raise your hand. Don't implicate yourself. And then they give you the, the, the five-inch binder. Just kind of nod like that, like I do, right? And you get, what happens, what do you do with that five-inch binder after the sales training? You put it, yeah, you put it on the shelf. And once in a while, you pass by, you look at it for inspiration, right? Once in a while, you touch it, hoping osmosis kicks in and you recall something, but it doesn't work. Because the problem is, sometimes, that program doesn't fit yours, right? How we sell. Sometimes, it's too complicated. It has 50,000 steps for you to close a sale. And some of you are very intuitive when it comes to selling, right? Also, the techniques are outdated. It's amazing how many people I see today using techniques that were invented back in the 1920s. Did you know that the first book really built on sales was by E.K. Strong, written in the 1920s? It was called The Psychology of Selling Life Insurance. 1920s. E.K. Strong was the first person to actually document scripts, using scripts, the open-ended question, the closed-ended question, the sales process. This is 1920s stuff. And then there was 1959, Betker. How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success. How many folks have read that? He was an insurance guy, one of the first people to write books on sales success. But again, did that change everything? Yes or no? See, that changed everything. But if we're still doing what they did in the 1920s and the 1950s, it doesn't apply anymore. From this day forward, forever and ever, our, our institution of selling will be known as pre-internet and post-internet. Because there's a difference. Something has changed in the psychology of how people buy. And unless we update how they think and how we should think, we're not going to sell. Let me give you a visual. If you have to buy a car, let's say your car breaks down. Your car breaks down, and what happens? How do you get a new car? Before the internet, what did you do? Yeah, we asked a few questions, see what people were driving, and then immediately, boom, we go see the dealer, right? And then we spend what? Two to three hours with the dealer, and they try to keep you on the lot as long as possible, right? Opportunity costs, because you don't want to do this all over again. And that's how we used to buy. Today, today, how do you buy? Car breaks down one too many times. What do you do? All of a sudden, you go online, consumer report, admins, you look at invoice, inventory, use versus new, you do the whole thing. When you walk on the lot, are you looking for a relationship? No, you're looking for a what? A car and a transaction, right? Because now, from a knowledge perspective, from a knowledge perspective, you're this far ahead. Are you with me? One study showed that the average consumer will look at 10 resources or 10 sources of information on the internet before they even contact you for the first time. 10 sources of information. A couple of studies have put that most buyers are 50 to 70 percent into the buying cycle before they contact you. This is interesting. Because you've done all this research, think about the car analogy again. You've done all this research, you're into the buying cycle, you know what you want, right? Before, back in the day, you, had, you came in here. I, as a salesperson, had this much time to build what? Rapport, relationship. Now they're walking in right here, and now you only have this much time to sell. And if you don't know your product and the consumer knows more than you, guess what? You're in trouble. But I'm going to show you how we can turn around a sale in that little bit of time. You with me? Cool, everybody got that? Okay. Now, I've always liked that, this statement. Their consuming choices have exploded. They don't need to buy your car, your widget, or service anymore. Again, it's a society where even if you came up with a differentiator in terms of product, what happens? Somebody else will what? Match that. So who becomes the ultimate differentiator today in the market? You. See, it's not what you sell, it's how you sell today because you are the differentiator. You're more important than ever in terms of selling. Before, you can actually do the comparative analysis and let them decide. Today, you have to reframe it, reposition it for them in such a way that they get it. It's not what you sell, it's how you sell. Now, would you agree with these statements? Today's client is more knowledgeable, demanding, sophisticated, and cautious. 
They're also less tolerant, less, less accessible, less loyal, and less trusting. Would you agree with that? So now we're fighting. So we got less time, and we're dealing with cynics. So this is our challenge in today's modern society, right? Get the idea? So I started asking myself a different question. Instead of how to sell, I asked myself, how do people buy? I looked at the other side of the equation. You know, what motivates people to make a buying decision? You know, during my conversations, I'll repeat that, during my conversations, because that is the most important time frame in any presentation, bless you, is the conversation. If I can find moments of influence within the conversation, I will move the sale in my direction. Also, how do they decide? How do they make buying decisions? Do you think it's possible that if I'm talking to somebody, I can guide them to come to a conclusion I've already predetermined, yes or no? I'll prove it to you. Get out a blank sheet of paper, real quick. We'll do this real quick. All right, blank sheet of paper, and then I'll borrow one. Can I borrow one sheet of paper from you? Pick a sheet. All right, all right. Now, all right, here's what I want you to do. Don't show your neighbor your number or your answer, right? Hide it. Now listen carefully. I want you to pick a number, listen carefully, between two and 10. Pick a number, don't show it to your neighbor. Pick a number between two and 10. Did you pick it? All right, take that number and multiply it by nine. You should have now a two-digit number. If you do not have a two-digit number, please leave the room, okay? <laughs> take those two digits, add them together, you should now have a single-digit number. You with me so far? All right, subtract the number five from that. Okay, now that number that you now have corresponds to a letter of the alphabet. So if it's a 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, 5E, write the letter down. Go ahead and write the letter down. Did you write the letter? All right. Now, listen carefully. Instructions are very important. I want you to think of a European, European country that begins with that letter. Write it down. European, I can see some of you have failed geography. Like, ha, 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 ha. So 20% of the room, gone. Okay, you got the country? Just nod. All right. Look at the second letter in that country. Look at the second letter. Think of a large land mammal that begins with that letter. Write that land mammal down. Just go ahead. Think of the land mammal. Now, last one. Write down the color of that mammal. What's the color of that mammal? Now, by a show of hands, you have to raise your flags on this one. If this makes sense, raise your hand. There are no gray elephants in Denmark. <laughs> He's a genius. Right? That's a cheesy example. By the way, Yes, it's a cheesy example, I know. But listen carefully. Average salespeople practice what to say. The best of the best. Superior salespeople practice what to ask. Because it's in our questions that we actually guide a conversation. So, real quick story. Uh, my family is originally from Puerto Rico. Anybody from Puerto Rico? That's how I usually feel. Not a problem. Anybody been to Puerto Rico? Very cool. Did you like it? Cool. Uh, my family moved in the 1950s. We were poor, 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 poor. Food stamps, government cheese, powdered milk. Raised near the Cabrini Green housing projects. You know, violence, gangs, drugs, all that stuff. And my mother was like, go to school, get the education, get the J-O-B. So that's what I did. So that's my background. Uh, engineering, MBA. Realized I didn't like being an engineer because I actually like money. So I moved over and became, uh, went into sales. And that's my background. Uh, by the way, before I forget, you know, some of the books. You can go to my website, victorantonio.com. You can download them. No email required. Download the books. By the way, would you like a copy of the presentation? Okay, I'll give it to you. So, uh, I'll give it to Angela in PDF form. I'll give it to her so you'll have a copy, and then you can just download. Okay, everybody cool? But by the way, just a secret. You know what I think I'll do on the side? Write this, write this link down. Uh, Sellinger Group, like selling er, selling -er group com, selling er group com forward slash nationwide. What I think, is, I think I'll do also is on the, in the next day or two, I'll post it there so you can download and not have to wait for anybody to give it to you, okay? SullingerGroup.com forward slash nationwide. Cool. Is that cool? Yes or no? Very cool. All right. I also have some videotapes. Uh, let me just for the managers here, if I can talk to the managers for just a second. Can I suggest one video series? I have about 15 of them. The upper left-hand one is really good, Monday Morning Sales Workout. It's a 15 to 30-minute workout. It's got the worksheet and everything, so you can do a little exercise with your team. Cool? And again, download them. You can download the videos, the worksheets, no email required. I'm not trying to get your email. It's just great information. All right? So I typically go to a lot of different places to speak, whether it's colleges, whether it's small businesses, 
large corporations, because I always have people say, Victor, do you really understand our business? Trust me. I work with so many different companies. You get to a point where you start understanding the model. But you also begin to understand the universal principle of selling. I can go to Motorola. I can go to Intel. I can go to Orkin. And I'm telling you, the same issues you're dealing with, they're dealing with also in this market. Everybody's dealing with the same issues. And I see it. And it's not only national, it's also what? International. I go international, same thing. I did an event in Bangkok. Guess what? Same thing. Saudi Arabia. Guess what? Same thing. Next, week, next month, I'll be in Dubai. Guess what? It's going to be the same thing. So I had a chance. To, how many people remember Zig Ziglar? You always ask me who was my mentor. Him and a guy by the name of Jim Rohn. You guys remember Jim Rohn? You should look Jim Rohn up. But anyway, now, stop. I'm going to do something really cool for you guys. I'm only going to do it for you. I don't do it for anybody else. But I'm going to do it for you. Why? Because I love you. What I'm going to do now is something interesting. I'm going to stop my presentation, and I'm going to analyze my own presentation. Because do you think, from the moment I got up here, I've been influencing you, guiding your behavior, so to speak? This I have, because this is what you should do. So let's look at what I did. Let's deconstruct it real quick. How did I start out the presentation? Remember this? It was this. And that's just to kind of what? Get you engaged. You know, you know, had a little fun with it. Kind of loosen you up a little bit, right? Then I said... Did you know that when you walk in the store, most stores leave what? 10 feet of space, right? Most people walk through the what? Are we impulse buyers? Yes or no? Right? I tell you about tips, you know, strategies you can use, right? All these different, different influence tips. And so what happens at that moment, you're like, really? Really? Even the most know-it-all skeptical person who starts out like this, because I know what you guys think when you walk in here. Oh, Lord. Another speaker, <laughs> right? It's been a long night. He better be good. He better be good. Yeah, and then the know-it-alls do this all the time. All right, go ahead. And he's bald. My God, he's bald, okay? And he doesn't even talk right, right? And so, but as soon as I start delivering insight, listen to what I just said. I just delivered what? So write this definition of insight down. Insight, my favorite definition, information beyond the obvious. Because do today's consumer want more information, yes or no? Yes or no? No. They don't want more information. What they want is more insight. That's information beyond the obvious. Because let's go back to the car analogy again. If I get here, and I already told you I'm 50 to 70% into the buying cycle, which means I've done research already. I look at how many sources? 10. So if you tell me things I already know, I'm not paying attention to you anymore. But if you give me insight, information I don't have or I couldn't find, then I'm listening to you. So then I delivered some insight. Did you know? Did you know when you walk into a store? Did you know? And I gave you that. And I was like, hmm, maybe this guy does know something. Right? And then I did the ultimate contrast. 98% of all the books are based on how to. But I'm not going to talk about how to sell. I'm going to teach you how people. What a contrast, right? That's what they do. But here's what we do. And then somewhere in here, I finally get around to all my pictures and my credentials. Right? Now, why did I start out with my pictures and my credentials? Come on, why? Because you don't care about me. You don't. I know what you say. Yes, I do, Vic. I love you. No, you don't. No, you don't. Think about this. This is important. I'm joking, but there's an important point here. Sometimes we get so involved in our own ego that we think it's about us and our company. When we're talking to the customer, it's not about you. And until I can build enough value up front, then you may care. Well, who is this guy? He's kind of smart, right? Now I want to know about you, which is why I put it towards now, as opposed to the beginning. When you're talking to a customer, look, I've seen this presentation. Hi, I'm with Nationwide. I've been around for 38 years, right? And I, we have, you know, our revenues are three gazillion dollars a year in annual revenue. We have 50 bazillion offices all over the world. We love our customers. We have 24-hour support. We're there for you all the time. We have, here's our new facility, our headquarters. 50,000 square feet, customer service, call center, 24-hour support, right? And then you give them the boom slide. You know what the boom slide is? Here, that's when you show all the logos of all the companies you work with. You ever see the boom slide, right? What's the customer thinking? You do five slides of this. At the beginning, what's the customer thinking? Who cares? Because I want to know how you can help me first. Because if you can't help me first, I don't care who you are. Listen carefully. A relationship is the result of the value delivered first. Listen to what I just said, because people always say, you know, it's about a relationship with the customer. 
But today, there's personal relationship and business relationship. Put personal relationship aside. In a business relationship, it's about what value do you give me so I can work with you, Victor? Victor, I like you, but what value do you deliver? And once I know the value, when you walk in this room, who are you thinking about? Me or yourselves? You're thinking about yourselves. You don't care about me. Here's what you're thinking. I mean this in a good way. How could this guy help me increase my sales, right? What can I learn from this guy today? That's what you care about. When you're talking to your customers, remember, it's not about you. It's always about them and delivering the value. You with me so far? Yes? Cool. All right. So here's the brain. I love the brain because once you understand the, the brain, you get people. This is the most basic model. By the way, the left brain, right brain dichotomy does not work, right? It's false. Uh, new fMRI machines, which are functional magnetic resonance imaging machines, can now look in your brain. And they've noticed that it's not about left or right lighting up, logic, creative. It's not about that. It's really about different parts of the brain lighting up. But so here's a new model for you. There's three parts. The prefrontal cortex, the new brain, the most recent brain, that's the logical side. Let me think about it. That's that one. Then there's the midbrain, the emotional impact. Ah, ah. Then the most important part of the brain, the old brain, the amygdala, the reptilian brain, that right there. That is like an alarm system. And as soon as I detect a threat, you're trying to take something from me, I shut down. That's why when you're caught selling, the customer just shuts down. If I'm confused, I'm lost, I feel threatened. Too many options. Shut down. I'll think about it. You get the idea? This is what we're triggering most of the time with our clients. I'll give you some examples. Let me just go there. I'll give you an example. There's something called the endowment effect. Has this ever happened? So you buy a pound of candy, right? You say, can I have a pound of candy, please? And they put the little paper on top of the scale. And then they start pouring the pound of candy. Now, externally, you're like, but internally, what are you doing? Yeah, that's right. Pour that candy, baby. Go on. Pour the candy, right? And so they're pouring the candy. You're like, oh, yes. And when they get to a pound, you're like, that's my pound. Externally, you're like, thank you. Right? But internally, yeah, right? The inner child wanting to get out. Right? That's scene one. Scene two. You're happy. You buy your pound of candy. Scene two. Same thing. They're pouring the candy. <sighs> Keep going. And then all of a sudden, they go over the pound, and the person scoops them back out. What does your brain yell? Whoa! Hey! Put that back. That's this part of the brain going, whoa, threat. Alarm, alarm, warning, warning. You know, he's trying to take something from me, right? And then, again, it's your alarm system because as soon you ever go to a buffet line and they do the fries thing? Remember the fries? And then they take fries away? It's, here's what's happening. Slow it down. Matrix time. What happens is here's your fries on the plate. As soon as these fries touch that fry, you mentally take ownership of the fries. It's the weirdest thing. By the way, the best salespeople, the smart salespeople, always go over the pound, right? Because then they what? They're like, you want it? They're going to go, yeah, I'll prove it to you. So they did an interesting study. Show you how this works and how you can apply it. They did an interesting study. I'm like, Group one, I'm going to give you a car loaded with all the options. Take out what you don't want, right? And then add up your average price, and then we'll get the average. You with me? Group two, what I want you to do is I'm going to give you the base model only. And then what you're going to do is you're going to add up in all the options you want. With me? And then we'll get the average price. Which side will have a higher average price? One or two? You guys are fast. One, why? Because what, what's going to happen over here is like, oh, I might need that. Oh, I might need that. Oh, I might need that, right? What's happening over here? Let's say, let's say you're from Minnesota. Yeah, for sure. You betcha. Anybody from Minnesota? Oh, offended two people. Good. Getting better. Ludwig is the left guy, Oli and Lena. Yeah. So, so, so you're from Minnesota, and you're like, I'm tough. Do I really need a heater in my car? No. You know, you, know, you start rationalizing why you don't. Because here, you already owned it, but here, you're like, do I really need it? Do you see the difference in questioning? The star salespeople will leave the extra candy because they'll go, would you like me to take that off? Or would you just like, you know, a little over a pound? What do most people say? Uh, yeah! This is the way I used to use it. Do you ever, ever have somebody say, you know, that's a little more than I expected to pay? You know, itemize everything? It's a little more than I expected to pay. Here's what I always did. Turn the paper around, slide it back over. Why don't you go ahead and take out what you don't want? What do you think they do? Uh, Oh, I might need that. It's interesting how your average sales price will go up just by using that strategy. 
Now, again, it's all about the conversations. This is a simple, simple example, but very powerful if you get it. So I want you to imagine that you're going into the store and you're looking for a can of paint. You're looking for a can of paint and there's two cans of paint. Can A is $15, can B is $20. Now you're already looking at which one? The $15 one, right? So sure enough, the salesperson, I'll read it for you folks in the back, says something like this. Dear customer, I strongly recommend can B. Now it's a higher price, but it will last eight years, whereas can A will only last four years. That means that over eight years, you'd have to buy can A twice. So if you buy can A, you'll be paying $30 instead of 20 a gallon. So in reality, can B is cheaper. Everybody with me so far? So you, the customer, like, yeah, so did you know that I'm preparing to sell my house? So I really don't care how long the paint lasts, right? Oh, oh, problem. Is the salesperson stuck? Not if he can provide what lies in this realm. What lies in this realm? Insight. Let's see if he can do that. Then he says this to the customer. I understand. But I still think can be is a better choice. Here's why. You see, can be contains 50% more pigment, which results in better coverage than can A. This means you will need to apply only one coat. If you have a dark wall, you'll have to apply two coats with can A, which will double your labor and your cost. Mm hmm. Thinking, thinking, right? Am I reshifting the conversation? The last, the salesperson, just to put it, tie it down, says, look, plus, you are guaranteed that your house, now you make the emotional impact, you're guaranteed that your house will look freshly painted, which in turn improves your chances of selling the house. Can you now see how spending an additional $5 is a great investment? But again, by providing that piece of insight, so the first one was all logical, right? Here's the difference. Here's why you should do it. Logical, prefrontal. Here, it was insight. Boom. Because the person's thinking, wait a minute, I don't want to have to paint this thing again. And then the emotional impact that you can sell the house. See, the, the, really the battleground today for salespeople sales today is the one-on-one -on -one sales conversations we're having with people. Nobody sees your company. I don't care how big you are. They see you, the individual, and it's in those conversations, those minor conversations that we're having that can create the big difference in the world. For example, I'll give you another example of a reframe. So my wife decides, by the way, been married 25 years, Four different women, add up the years, who cares, right? <laughs> so that was a joke. Women always like, oh, it's not funny. One wife, 25 years, and guess where she's from? Minnesota, yeah. <laughs> Talk about a cultural shift, Puerto Rican, Minnesota, <laughs> right? So my wife says, to celebrate our 25th year anniversary, we've never done anything extravagant, right? So she wants to do some landscaping, hardscape, landscape, right? And so she's like, let's get a designer. I'm like, really? You know? Uh, and so we decide to get a designer. Make a long story short, the guy comes over, looks at the place, comes back a week later with the design, right? And so me and my wife agree. Okay, we're going to think about it, and I'll make a decision right there and then, right? So the guy rolls out the design. And as soon as he rolls it out, my wife goes, <gasps> I'm like, no! Don't do that! Don't, don't do that! <laughs> You're not helping me. She goes, <gasps> I said, yeah! And so, and the sales guy looked at me like, Dude, I got you. He goes, I so have you. I'm like, oh. And I didn't tell him what I did, right? I just didn't tell him because then they just get all weird on you, right? And so we're going through this. And then my wife says, are those Japanese maples? The guy says, yes. Isn't that what you wanted? I'm like, oh, don't, don't do that. Don't do it. So he drops the price on us. And it's like a napalm, right? You're like, you're like, and I'm like feeling it right here. And then my wife's like, well, what do you think? I'm like, no, we said we were going to think about it. Don't give me the what you think, because I know what that means. That means yes in your language. A salesperson just going, Zzz, right? And so, interesting. So then he says, the way it works is, it's a big price tag. He goes, 50% to get the project started and 50% upon completion. Now, what he didn't know was that when we lived in Miami, uh, a couple of times people stole our money and never came back, right? And so me dropping 50% of that big number was not in the plans, right? Now, he didn't know what the real objection was, so I had to help him out, give him a layup. I said, no, you're not understanding. It's not that we can't afford it. It's just that that number is too high and 50% down. Here's what happened to us in Miami. This is why we don't want to do it. And then he said this to me. He says, Victor, let me ask you a question. I'm like, oh, that's my line, right? <laughs> oh, that's my line. Let me ask you a question. He says, he says, how many contractors do you hire a year? So 
We didn't need contractors. I mean, I mean yeah, everything, like electricians, plumbing, yeah. I don't know, four, five, maybe, I don't know, right? <laughs> so I said, why? He goes, do you know how many clients I hire a year? I said, what? He says, do you know how many clients like you I hire a year? First of all, I never looked at myself as being hired. He says, do you know how many hire? I go, no. I was caught off guard, like, no, how many? He goes, I hire between 150 to 200 clients a year, like yourself. And my big question is, just like you, you're wondering if I'll take your money. I'm wondering if you can pay. He says, and I said, wait a minute. It's not that I can't afford to pay. I got the money. I mean, I'll show you the bank account. I got the account. I got the money. It's not about the money, right? And so I'm doing all this explaining, and then I caught myself, and I go, oh! Because at that point, I realized that he had pushed me back, reframed the whole thing, and I'm defending myself, justifying that I can't pay for it. And, and I was conflicted, because on one hand, I go, you're evil. You're the essence of evil for doing that. But from a sales training standpoint, I go, oh, that was brilliant, brilliant move, right? <laughs> brilliant move. So I was like, uh, 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 right? And I, 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 I have to report that we, the landscaping was done. Beautiful, magnificent, discount zero. So I, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I know I've disappointed you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All right, I'm going to give you the killer sales app. You ready for it? What's that? We did third, third, third. That was it. That was, that was our negotiating midpoint. But did I get a discount? No, because he did the same thing I did to him. I would do to him. As soon as I said, that's more than we expected to pay, what do you do? Why don't you go ahead and take out what you don't want? And then my wife is like, why, why, why do you want to take that out? I'm like, <laughs> it's the longest. You know, I'm just like, love the woman, love the woman. All right, All right. I'm going to show you a killer sales app. Now, I don't usually show this sales app to just everybody, but I'm going to show it to you. Why? Yeah, yeah, see? You got it. All right. Are people motivated more by the fear of loss or desire for gain? Fear of loss, right? Then why is it that we always sell the feature, benefit, advantage, value, gain? Maybe we should focus on the other side of the equation, which is called the loss, because it's more impactful. But we're never really taught to do that sometimes. We're so focused on selling the features and benefits, we never look at selling the loss. Let me give you an example. Ernest Dichter is the father of motivation research. If you watch Mad Men, this series, a lot of that stuff is based on Ernest, Ernest Dichter's work, Strategies for Desire, a book that was written in the 1950s. Ernest Dichter studied why people make buying decisions. This is the true father of motivation research. And he said something interesting. In order to get people to buy, you must make them constructively discontent. When I first heard that, it was an interesting phrase. But the more I thought about it, it made sense. That if I'm happy with what I have, I don't want what you have to offer because I'm happy. But if you make me unhappy with what I have, I'm going to buy. I'll give you an example. Remember back in the day when we had the record player? Remember that? Record player, right? Yeah, I remember there was a 33s, 45s, and ah, old school in the house, right? Ready? And once in a while, you pass by the record player. Did you ever do that? Cop a scratch? Chicka, chicka, yeah. Right? No? That was just me? Okay. So, so you were happy with your record player. Some of you got it, some of you didn't. That's okay. So you were happy with your record player. And then what came out? CD? What? A-track. A-track came out, and you're like, wow, eight songs. I don't have to worry about the needle jumping, right? And I can take it with me, boom, boom box, first one right there. Can't hear out of this here, but that's okay. Right there, right? So all of a sudden, I became constructively discontent because I didn't want to have, I mean, my stereo wasn't portable. You don't want to put a stereo in a car. That's ghetto. You know what I mean? So what I want to do is what? Get the A-track. I can put that in my car, right? So good enough. So I'm discontent with my record player. I move over to the A-track, and I'm happy with my A-track. Love my A-track. Then what comes out? You're like, wow, smaller, and I can fast forward. Because if you remember the A-track, if you wanted to listen to your song again, what you have to do? Drive around the block a few times, right? Just to get back to your song. Am I right? Raise your hand if you're guilty. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I know I'm not the only one. You're like, because you couldn't fast forward, right? Click, click, click. Remember that click, click, click? It was so irritating. Young people were like, what's he talking about? Shut up. <laughs> what's he talking about? I don't know. So, so <laughs> it's okay. So all of a sudden, I'm unhappy with my A-track because I move over to the cassette because the cassette, you can forward it, and I got 12 songs. Now. I'm like, wow, I'm so happy with my cassette. Then what comes out? CD comes out. Did people move over to the CD? Yes or no? No, not immediately. Something interesting happened. When the CD came out, people said round versus square. I don't see the difference. And that's when marketing, how many marketing people do we have in here? Just two? Yeah. That's when the evil geniuses went to work on your brain. See, they figured out that you didn't want to move over. So then they do what marketing does best. They make up things, 
right? And so they made up a phrase called high fidelity. Now, you didn't know what high fidelity was. Never heard of high fidelity. Marketing people came up with that phrase. But marketing people were smart enough to know that I'm not going to try to explain to you technically like a 40 dB roll-off frequency, frequency range. They just say, no. Here's high fidelity as they define it. Here's the commercial. How would it go? Hi, buy a CD. It has high fidelity. What's high fidelity? Go back home and listen to your cassette. In the background you hear, you won't hear that with a CD. You're like, what? I never heard this in the background. Right? What? And so what do you do? You go back home. You remember you pop in the tape? Remember you got to pop it in on an angle the right way? Right? Bam. Right? You close it. And by the way, do you remember how we used to pirate music back then? You used to wait for the commercial to end and you get the two fingers. <laughs> remember the two fingers? Remember the two finger move? The two finger move. <laughs> Shut up. Time the commercial. Time the commercial. Bam. Pirate. Through. And then there was that one DJ who wouldn't shut up. You're like, dude, shut up. You're messing up my mix, right? You're like, you're messing up my song. Sorry, just taking you back. That's all I'm saying. So what happens is you pop in, you pop in the cassette, you pop in the cassette, and what do you hear? And you're like, whoa, where did that come from? But it was always what? There. Let me stop. I'm having fun, but there's an important point here. This is what we do with clients. Sometimes the client can't hear the hiss. And what's the hiss? Something they're missing. Something the policy they hold doesn't offer. That's the insight piece, the piece of information they don't have. Your job is to provide the hiss. Make them aware of the hiss. And once it, something is pointed out, what happens? You hear it all the time. That's our job. How do you point out the hiss so they can hear it and they become constructively discontent with what they have and they'll move over? By the way, they moved us from the CD. How did they make us unhappy with the CD? They came out with the MP3 iPods, right? What did they say to move us over? What did they say to move us over? Why should we buy, go from a CD to an MP3? Why? Thousands of songs, 3,000 songs, the exact amount I need for my listening pleasure. You know, I hear young people complain. I'm like, dude, eight. Start out with eight. Shut up, right? So all of a sudden they said, you know, less size. You don't have to put the CDs in your visor so nobody gets judgmental on you. You ever had that friend that sits in the passenger side? Really? You listen to that? Shut up. You avoid that whole thing situation, right? So then, smaller space, more, more, more songs, and you can carry them with you. Then they told you, forget the MP3, forget the iPod. You want to put it on your phone, right? And now you got it on the phone. Now they're saying, don't put it on your phone. My God, you might lose it. Where do you want to put it? They're constantly moving us, making us unhappy with what we have so we can buy what they have. Okay? Here's the financial advisor. Pretend that you want to give me some financial advice, right? And all of a sudden, I give you all my information, you boot up the software, and you say something like this. Victor, based on the information you've given me, you have a 78% chance of meeting your retirement goal. Wow. I'm pretty happy about that. What if I reframe that and say this? Based on the information you've given me, Victor, 22 out of 100 people with your strategy will end up eating cat food in the dark. Now, what's interesting, it's really the same message, kind of. One's the feature, one's the loss, right? By the way, interesting note, interesting note. Did you know that we can't visualize percentages, but we can visualize ratios? So when you really want to highlight something for somebody, use ratios, because people can visualize ratios, they can't visualize percentage. I'm joking with this, but again, it's about selling the loss. Let me give you a real example. So I have a mailbox over at UPS, and it's my time to renew my contract. Sally says, Victor, are you going to renew your contract? Maybe at the UPS store. I said, I don't know. I said, you know, I never noticed the small ones. How much do they cost? 160 bucks. I'm thinking, man, 220, 160, that's $60. That's like 12 lattes for me, right? And I'm thinking, 60 bucks is 60 bucks. And so she looks at me, and you ever know when somebody's about to do the sales? You know, they give you that sales look. You can hear that Clint Eastwood music in the background. Oh, right? Because you're about to be sold, right? And I'm like, oh, my God, here it is. And then you brace for yourself for the sales pitch, right? And then, so I said, I know what she's going to say. I know what she's going to say. Sally's going to say, Victor, the reason you want to go with the bigger mailbox is because it's easy access, bigger is better, it's more convenient, Victor. You don't have to pick up your mails as often, Victor, and your mailbox won't get jammed or letters won't get crushed. And guess what, Victor, the reason you want to stay with the big box is because it can also handle bigger packages. Victor, that's why you want to stay with the big one and pay the 220 Is that what Sally did? No, no, no. Here's what Sally did. Victor, 
let me ask you a question. No, not that again. She said, let me ask you a question. I'm like, ah. I said, what? And I got attitude at this point. I'm like, what? What? Right? I go, she goes, you realize that if you change your mailbox, you'll have to also have to change your address? Yeah. I said, you'll also have to change the information on your business card so you have to print up some new one. So? Right? She says, you'll also have to change the information on your website, so if you don't edit your website, you'll probably have to hire somebody to do that. I'm feeling a little wobbly, but I'm holding strong. I said, yeah, doesn't matter. She goes, also, you'll have to change all the information on your promotional materials. And then, last but not least, because you change your address, you'll have to contact your clients to let them know that your mailbox has changed. Victor, let me ask you one final question. I said, what? She said, how much time and money is that going to cost you? Man, without pausing, without hesitating. I said, just renew the contract. Just, 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 just renew that thing. Now, here's what's interesting. Again, pointing out the hiss. Having fun but let's bring it back to what we can use. I wasn't listening to the hiss. I was focused on $60. That's where my brain was at. What she did is she took the hiss from the back of my head that I wasn't even thinking about, which is all the time and effort, and brought it where? Right there, and my alarm system back here said, oh, we don't want to do that, Victor. Don't do that. Don't, don't change mailbox. Are you starting to understand this? It's really about how do we emphasize the law so customers get this. Selling the Invisible by Harry Beckwith. My favorite quote of all time. People do not look to make the superior choice. They want to avoid making a bad choice. Get the idea? Some people won't make a decision because they don't want to make a bad choice. Buyers regret, right? They don't want to make a bad choice. Real quick, I got two lessons for you, and I'm going to get into some important stuff here. Morton and Deutsch and Gerard did an interesting study. I'm going to break this room up into three pieces, three groups. Okay, group one, mentally, what I'm going to do I'm going to draw some lines, right? I want you to look at all these lines, estimate the lengths of the line, and then come up with an average. I just want you to think about your answer. This is group one right here. You with me? Okay. Group two, middle section here. What I want you to do, look at the lines, do the same thing, estimate the length of the line, come up with an average in your head, but then I want you to write it on the magic pad. How many folks remember the magic pad? Oh. Yeah, you guys don't want to admit it, do you? How's that? Memories. Oh, look at you. What, did it come back? I had Mighty Mouse. Right? So what I want you to do in the middle is to write your answer down on the magic pad and then go, and then erase the answer. You with me? Group three, wall here. What I want you to do is I want you to, again, look at the answer, look at the board, rather, estimate the length, write your answer on a piece of paper, sign it, and submit it to me. Good? Second phase of the experiment, I'm going to come back with an answer I know does not match yours. I know this. So what happens when I go to group one and show my answer? What do you think group one's going to do? They had to think about it, and I show them an answer that doesn't mess or doesn't match with theirs. What will they do? Agree or disagree? They'll, they'll be like, eh, whatever, Victor. I'm just a squirrel trying to get a nut. It's your world. Right? They don't care. They don't care. In the middle, some of you got the reference. I like that. In the middle, you guys wrote it on the magic pad and then erased it. You put up a little resistance, but eventually you go, what? Whatever, Victor. Yeah, whatever. I don't really care. What does group three do? Screw you, Victor. I'm right, you're wrong. Why? Because they've made a public commitment. Listen carefully. You want to understand politics today? Why it's so polarized? Because as soon as you make a verbal commitment to something, a public commitment. Studies have shown that you will defend that position. If you say I'm a Democrat, you will look for information to justify why you're a Democrat. If you say I'm a Republican, you will do the same thing. If you say I'm an independent, we'll do the same thing. One day we'll figure out, we'll just say we're all Americans and then we can focus on that part, right? But that's what happens. And in business, when you take a position, when you say, no, I wrote it down, I made a public commitment, you can't change my mind. Everybody with me? This is important. I'm going somewhere with this. Lesson two, I got to sell you two burgers. Which one would you buy? On average, which burger would most people buy? Okay, apparently some of you are really hungry, right? <laughs> Most people would choose the small one. When given two options, people will mitigate the risk and go for the small one. So then, what if I wanted to sell you the big burger? As a good salesperson, I can just what? Sell you features, sell you the benefits, sell you the gain, sell you the advantage of buying buy the big burger. More tomatoes, right? More lettuce, right? That's what we do. But the best way to influence somebody is to simply what? Right? And all of a sudden, what does your brain do? Middle. Middle. You'll go, oh, too small. Ooh, too big. Middle. 
And what do you think the biggest profit is? The one in the middle. Starbucks does this to you. McDonald's does this. Everybody does this to you with three options. Nobody offers you two options. So from this day forward, how many options should you offer? Three. I had somebody ask me, Victor, 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 what if I only have two options? What did I say to him? What did I say? Yeah. God, you guys are so good. This is my group hug gesture. Group hug. Right? Right. Just offer a third one. That's how the brain thinks. Now, here's some wine. Three bottles of wine. Which one would you most likely choose? One in the middle. I'm not trying to trick you. But what if we're in the save mode? In a recession, Victor, I don't have a lot of money. Which one would I choose now? People will still migrate. The majority will still migrate towards the middle. Again, people are always looking to mitigate the risk. Keep this in mind. This is very powerful. Now, I got a quick story for you. I'm going to get into it real quick in and out. This is probably the most important piece. Everything else was a foundation for what I want to show you now. If you learn this strategy, I think your close rate will go up. Some of you may do this subconsciously already, but I'm going to make it conscious. So if you know it consciously, you can actually share it and teach it. So in 2006, a company calls me up and says, Victor, we'd like you to do some training for us, and we have a software package, and we'd like you to train on the software. I said, yeah, what's the deal? He says, what we do is we put people in a room just like this. You spend all day showing them the software. The software had a lot of back office stuff. Don't need to get into details. He says, what we want you to do is just present the software, show people how to use it, and then close people in the room. We have a $3,000 package. We have a $6,000 package. And I said, do I have to sell it? He goes, no, no, you just present. Show them the value. Go buy, right? And I'm like, now, I'm a sales guy. So what is the first question I have? They have six sales trainers already, and they want to hire me as number seven. What is the first question I have? Come on, yell it out. Be bold, be bold, be bold. Yell it out. Yes! A true sales guy. How much money does your average trainer make? See, because I'm coin operated. I don't know if you knew that. Put a coin right there, I start selling, man. Right? That's how it works. There's nothing wrong with that. By the way, I always have to remind salespeople. Do you realize that we salespeople are the irreducible primaries of capitalism? You know what I mean by that? We're the smallest of business units that moves an economy. Without sales, nothing moves. Should you like making money? Yes, you know. Yeah. And I always explain this to people. There's a difference between self-interest and selfishness. Let me explain this to you so you'll never forget it. Then you'll understand selling. Selfishness is if I sell you something that I know it has no value, will not benefit you in any way, but I still make money, that's selfishness. But if I sell you something that I know has value for you, will give you value, provide you value, and I get paid for highlighting that value, should I not get paid for that? Yes or no? That sales. You with me? So I'm in this room. The guy says, he told me how much these trainers make. And I was like, what? I mean, my jaw just, poof, literally. I'm like, and so you know how you're so confused because somebody says something that's so, it's just not comprehensible. And I said, let me think about it. I'll call you tomorrow. I didn't call the guy for a week. The guy calls me back. His name is Jason. Calls me back. Says, Victor, oh, you never called us back? I said, ah, you told me the sales trainers make that much. I just don't believe it. So I'll tell you what. We're going to fly you down to Tampa. We've got an event. He says, we've got one of our trainers coming in. He's going to do his thing. Uh, what you'll do is you'll sit in the back and watch it. We'll pay all your expenses. Sure enough, 200 people in the room. I'm sitting in the back with my friend Jason. This guy starts going. He just starts presenting the product all day. $3,000 package, $6,000 package. Start explaining the software. By lunch, some people had bought. Let me run to the end. By the end of the day, 50% of the room bought. All right? So let's make numbers easy. Only 100 people in the room, 50% bought, 50 people bought. That means 50 times 3,000. Run the numbers, right? The interesting part was 80% bought the $6,000 package. Really run the numbers now. And the only question I have to Jason is what? How much money did that guy up there just make? And when he told me, I'm like, where's the contract? Sign me up, right? A month later, they throw me down after they gave me a script, they gave me the slides, they showed me how to use the software, they sent me down to Jackson, Mississippi. Why Jackson, Mississippi? They're thinking I couldn't do a lot of damage down there, if you know what I mean. So I go down there. Did I, did I just lose the Mississippi folk? Yeah. So I go down to Jackson, Mississippi, got a room, it's got about, I don't know, uh, the amount of people they had, but I remember we made $54,000 that day, right? I knew what my cut was, so I was happy. But they weren't happy because I only closed 17% of the room. And they're saying, our minimum, Victor, is 33% close rate. I was like, oh. So for the next month or two, I'm struggling to try to get the 33. I'm just not getting there. I'm just not getting there. And I'm presenting. I'm doing you know, the whole thing. I'm just not getting it. Finally, I said, Jason, what am I doing wrong? We videotaped it. We tried to analyze it. Just nothing. He says, finally, he says to me, you got to call Clint. Now, Clint was the president of the company, right? And he's like that guru, you know, the guy that glows, that sits on top of the mountain and goes, hum, 
that guy, right? So Clint says, I'll meet you in California. I want to see what you do. So within the first hour and a half, we're in California. Take a break after the first hour and a half. I can still see Clint walking down. And he says, Victor, I know what your problem is. And this is the important part. He goes, Victor, you have people in the audience just like yourselves. He says, and they have reasons why they don't want to buy. And I said, yeah. He says, your job is to take that objection and tie it down. I still remember the visual. You've got to take that objection. You've got to tie it down. To which I said, how do you do that? And he goes, typical manager says, I don't know. You just got to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just lost point with managers in this room. Just kidding. So he says, you've got to figure out how to tie it down. And it was about a month or two later, I can't remember what the time frame was, that I figured out how to tie down these objections. And I came up with this formula. And let me just walk you through it, because if you use this in your one-on-one -on -one conversations, whether it's over the phone or face-to-face, -face, doesn't matter. I'm telling you right now, you will close higher. A sales objection is a publicly stated opposition. I told you that if somebody verbalizes something, what happens? They've taken a position. If I say, well, that's too expensive, what did I just do? I verbalized something, and I took a position. Now you have to defend that position. So you're taught to overcome the objection, yes? Now, do we still have to overcome objections in this world? Yes, when you miss one. But the goal here is not to overcome objections. It's to block the objections before they verbalize it. Think of the pad example here. These guys just thought about it, and they said, whatever. I believe you. Why? Because it was still up here. These folks who wrote it down says no, because they made it a public statement. You with me so far? So now, how do you do this? By raising it. Now, let me walk you through something real quick. What you want to do is raise the objection. That's not new. But here's how you tie it down systematically. What if I then offer to resolve the objection? What if I then demonstrate something? And then what if I then tie something down? You with me? Now, I need your attention. Really focus on what I'm about to say. This is the most important part of the presentation. Okay? What I'm about to show you is so important that if you get this visual, you're going to be great salespeople. Better than you are today. Why? Now, what's always interesting is that people who've been in this business a long time will see this and go, I know that I do that. And the, the problem with great salespeople who've been around and know their business is the majority of them can't what? Verbalize what they do. But I'm going to teach you how to verbalize what you're doing because some of you already know how to do this. Let me just stop real quick and just go through this. When you're talking to a customer, let's say you're doing a 30, I don't know, let's call it a 45-minute conversation, right? With me so far? Would you say resistance is high? Yes, right? Especially if they're not motivated right now to buy. Not trying to trick you, right? Yes, with me? Our job simply is to reduce that resistance within that 40 minutes to some arbitrary point, and below that point, they will buy. Yes? That's sales. I don't care how complicated you want to make it. That's it. Our job is to reduce resistance. You with me? OK, now, second part of this. Almost the same model. Now, let's talk about you, because it is about you. When you're listening to a presenter like me, you walk into this room or any of these other rooms, you walk in, and you're going to run into three types of presenters. I'm going to give you the three models. Here. There's the, when you first walk in, you're at 100% attention, right? All right, let's see what this guy has, right? Let's see what she can do, right? So then you're at 100% attention. But then they start talking. And it goes, wah, 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 wah. You ever had that speaker? You know that speaker? After a while, you're, you're just like, somewhere here. I mean, here, physically, you're like, but you're like, zonked out, right? You're somewhere else. That's one type of speaker. Do you ever have this speaker? Starts out great. Great energy, great energy. Then just starts dying, right? And then somewhere right here, they say, in conclusion. Oh, concluding, 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 concluding. <laughs> All of a sudden, your attention span goes right back up. You ever see that speaker? Right? They start out great. Then somewhere in the middle, they die. Then they go, in conclusion, you're like, OK, I'm back with you. And all of a sudden, you lose all this information. Right? You with me so far? The third type of speaker you want to be is up here somewhere. Now, let me ask you a question. Is it possible to maintain somebody's attention 100% of the time? Yes or no? It's not. Not even I can do it. Nobody can do it. It's hard. Why? Let's think about this. Let's go back to the brain. Your brain is an energy hog, right? And it's always consuming energy, but it's also trying to what? Always reallocate resources. 
So for example, I start talking. If it is of interest to you, your brain says, hey, survival mechanism, let's listen. We may be able to use something. As soon as I start saying, hey, let's talk about open-ended questions. Well, an open-ended question is one where you want to garner more information. A closed-ended question would be one where you just want some confirmation. What's a sales process? Well, everybody, as soon as I do that, what are you doing? <laughs> the brain says, the alarm system says, reallocate resources now. Reallocate the resources now. So what happens is you're staring at me like this. But then you're thinking about, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? <laughs> right? Ah, maybe I shouldn't have stayed out late last night. This is not helping, right? But you're paying attention to me, right? That's because your brain, the, the survival mechanism is saying, do something else because this ain't worth your time. You with me? So you look at a computer. It's a perfect example of your brain. When you don't use a computer for a while, what happens to it? It goes to what? Screensaver or hibernates, right? Because it's trying to what? Conserve energy. That's what the brain does. Survival. It's trying to conserve energy. So how do you wake the computer back up? Do this. Put your finger like this. Put your finger like this. You wiggle the mouse. So what you want to do is when you're talking to a customer, you want to wiggle their mouse. I mean, wait a minute. That came out wrong. That came out wrong. Wait, wait. No, not like that. What I want to do is that I want you to visualize that when you're talking to a customer, you want to, on the top of their head is what? Almost visually wiggle their mouse. What do I mean by that? I've been doing it to you since I started. Because every time, here's what happens. I can't keep your attention 100% of the time. But what will happen is, is your attention will start waning, right? But instead of letting it drop, right here somewhere, I insert what is known as a pattern interrupt. A pattern interrupt is, let me ask you a question. Pattern interrupt. Let me tell you a story. Pattern interrupt. Let me show you this graphic. Here's an example. Pattern interrupt. Remember the thing? Remember I did the example here? Hole in the wall. And I told you that? Pattern interrupt. Right? When you're showing visuals, that's a pattern interrupt. And the best of the best, what they do, and maybe some of you do this intuitively, is that during your 45-minute conversation, what you're doing is inserting. Every time you start dying, you insert a pattern interrupt, and you kick them back up again. Right? They start dying again. You what? Insert another pattern interrupt. Get the idea? Yes? Okay? That's what you're doing all the way throughout the presentation. That's what I've been doing to you all throughout to keep you in this band, right? To keep you alert. Now, I also told you in the background that I don't want your resistance to go what? I do want your resistance to go where? Down there. So I want to maintain your attention up here. This is attention, right? But I want to bring your resistance down there. You with me so far? Right? That's really it. That's all we're trying to do. So get back to this. When I raise an objection that you had in your head, I now control that objection. Would you agree? Let me give you an example. Here's one of the objections those folks had. In their mind, they were thinking, that software's hard to use. I don't know if I can use it. Do I wait for them to say something? No. What I do is from the front of the room, I say something like this. Many of our existing clients think our software is hard to use, and that's understandable. What did I just do? Raise the objection. What are they thinking? He goes, I'm glad he raised the objection because I didn't want to say anything, right? But you're building credibility as well, right? Because I'm glad he thought of it. Then I say this, but let me show you how easy it is to use that even you'll agree that even a technophobe such as yourself can use it. At this point, I go into demo phase. What's demo? It's a pattern interrupt. So then I say, let me just show you. Point, click, drag, drop, cut, paste, generate report. And then I get the commitment. I say, based on what I've shown you, do you think with a little practice and our support, do you think you can do this yourself? And if you do this and you wait, what do people say? Yeah. And as soon as they say yes, what did I just do? I just tied down that specific objection. Are you with me on this? So now, on average, you have three to five objections. You with me? Three to five objections. What if, strategically, strategically, what if, you plan to block objections along your presentation process. Here are three to five objections, right? So the first one is too technical, right? What happens to resistance? Because I'm addressing your issues. Down. Then it goes what? Down. Down. Are you with me? This is important. Now, here's another one. I always get this from people. Oh, Victor, I don't need any sales training. I've been in the sales for years. 
You ever have that person, right? The know-it-all? So here's what I say. Tell me if any of this sounds familiar. Remember this whole thing about how many years have you been in sales? Five years. Ten years. Remember that? Flashback to that. Now, many of you have been in sales for many years. You probably know more than I do. Does that sound familiar? Oh, Victor, you're so evil. I can't believe you pulled that on us. Yeah. And then I said something like this. Even if you've been in sales that long, if I can show you one or two things that could help you increase your sale, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Victor. Yeah, show me what you got. Show me what you got. All of a sudden, whether you realize it or not, your resistance when what? Because I acknowledge your expertise. And all of a sudden, you're like, ah, did I raise that objection? So, yeah, you can insert these. So now, if you have three to five typical objections, you know what they are. Price, is that a big one? Yes or no? Price is always a big one. Let me just check time real quick. All right. Write down the last two digits of your Social Security number. Do this real quickly. Last two digits. If you don't remember, just make two up. Okay? <laughs> Doesn't matter. All right. Put a dollar sign in front of it. Put a dollar sign in front of it. Circle that sucker. That's your number. Got it? Look at it. Stare at it. Love it. Got it? Own it. Got it? Now, I'm going to sell you three products. Dan Ariely did this study, and I want to share it with you. I want you to take the price you have that you wrote down. I want you to mentally insert it right here. Just mentally insert it right there. With me? Now, what I want you to do is ask yourself, would I pay this much for a wireless mouse? If yes, leave the price alone. If no, what would you pay? Write that down. Okay? Did you write it down? Same thing for a wireless keypad. Would you pay that price? If not, what would you pay? Oh, by the way, look up here for just one second. Check it out. That is a perfectly round head. I don't care what you say. <laughs> what was that? What was that? God, you guys are good. Okay. Now, design book. Would you pay that amount? If not, what would you pay? Just write a price down. It doesn't matter. Dan Ariely did this study, and here's what he came up with. He found out that depending on whatever number you wrote down would influence what you would pay. So if your price range was zero, your numbers was zero, zero to one nine, here were the average prices. If it was two, zero to three, nine, here were the average prices. What do you start noticing as you move from left to right? What do you start noticing? They're going higher because what you pay for something was based on a reference number that you already had in your head. That's how you were influenced. That said, real quick, should I create value first when I talk to a customer or should I drop price early? On them. Value, price, let's talk about it. Let's say you have a sales process, right? And it's like this, preliminary, hey, how you doing? How you been? Investigate, here's some key questions. Demonstrate, here's what we have to offer. And then you present price. And then what is the customer thinking throughout this? Every time you say, we offer this, we offer that, we offer this, what is it saying? How much, right? How much? And every time you say, we offer this, offer that, it's like, how much? Then they ask you, well, how much is it going to cost? You go, I'll get to that in just a bit. Da -da 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 -da. How much is that going to cost? I'll get to that in just a bit, right? You ever have that pitch happen? And so all of a sudden, when you finally drop the price, what happens? They either have one or two reactions. Oh, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, right? Never does, right? But they're going to probably say, you've got to be kidding. And at that point, the survival brain says, uh, I'll just think about it. Let me just think about it. Because you've activated the brain. Not a good thing. What if we insert a price earlier in the process? Now, I'm not saying you go, you walk in the door, hey, here's how much it costs, and then explain things. I'm not saying that. Somewhere early in the sales process, you drop price. Now, if I drop the price early in the process, let's say in the first 10 to 15 minutes, let's say I drop it in somewhere here, right? What is the customer now thinking? What is the customer now? I dropped price earlier. Wow, sounds like a lot of money, right? But now, as I'm telling them, it also includes this, it also includes that, and did you know this, and did you know that? What is the customer thinking? Oh, okay, okay. They're doing this mental calculus in their head. You get the idea? You see the difference? Here they're going, how much? How much? Here they're going, okay, okay, I can see why this costs this much. And they're starting to evaluate. You with me so far? Now, you ever have that one happen to you? Your price is too high, right? Wonderful. So many of my clients tell me our prices are high, but I, you know, and that's understandable, but that depends on what you're buying. Now, our typical product cost is $2,500 a year, whatever you want to call it, right? I said, but that really depends, again, on the options. Let me go ahead and show you some options and let you decide. Does that sound fair? Customer's going to say, yeah, go ahead. 
So then I pattern interrupt him, right? I show him something, show him some graphs, show him some things, tell him some information, share some insight. And then I'm going to show you something right now. I anchored him at what? 2,500. It's in their head. I anchored him at 2,500. Do my show and tell. Now, I'm going to show you what I say right here once I'm done demoing. You tell me not what you think. Tell me what you feel right here. What do you feel? We have a $2,500 option, a $1,500 option, and a $500. Based on what I've shown you, which one of these do you think best fits your needs or budget? What did you feel? What did you feel? I got a choice. And did you feel a sense of relief? Because you were like, ah, oh, $2,500, too expensive. So what would you rather have people feeling like how much, how much, or feeling relieved that they have options? By programming people, anchoring them early with pricing, you now can actually now add value. See, the problem when people say, well, Victor, you've got to sell the value. Well, the value compared to what? Or to what? What's the reference point? As soon as I say it's $2,500, now when I add things, I'm adding stuff that has $2,500, and I'm doing the Ben Franklin thing mentally, right, of why you should do it. But if you just say add value, that's not the key. You guys with me? Now, which gas station would you buy from? One or two? Real quick, one or two? The first one is positioned as a discount. The other one's positioned as a surcharge. It's called framing, how I frame the prices. Your prices are too high. Here's another strategy. You don't like anchoring? Frame them. Frame them with something like this. Our clients tell us our price too high. That's understandable. But instead of giving a $2,500 anchor, I now do a what? A frame. I give them a range. Do you think that puts them a little bit at ease? Because they have the range. Absolutely. Then you go through your whole pitch, the whole bit. By the way, what would you change? Where it says resolve statement, what would you change? What, how would you change that verbiage? What's wrong with that verbiage? Under offer, the resolve statement, what's wrong with it? What's that? Not the three options in this case. We're just doing range. What did I do? That's it. You want to go not 500 up to 2,500 because that's the last thing they'll remember, right? You want to go 2,500 all the way down to 500. Words matter. Last but not least, my last slide, and I'll let you guys go. They did this study, and this is a fascinating study because it tells you that some of us think it's about pricing. It's never about pricing. It really isn't about pricing. I'll prove it to you. They did this study because they wanted to understand how people make buying decisions. People, when they're making a buying decision, typically have four concerns. It's what they need, the cost, the right solution, and the risk. Let me set it in the context that we'll all understand. So let's say that you graduated from college and you have an engineering degree, right? And let's say that you, with that engineering degree, you get a great job, and you decide to buy your first RX-7, <laughs> two-seater. I'm not saying it's about me. I'm just saying, right? And so then you meet a nice girl because of the RX-7, I think, right? And so then you decide to marry that girl, right? So you marry that girl, and things are fine with your RX-7. You got a beautiful girl. You got an RX-7. Life is so good, right? And then you get home one day. She gives you the blessed news. We're going to have a baby. I have a moment of joy and a moment of what? Guy sadness, right? Because <laughs> now the RX-7 has to go what? Bye-bye, right? So now you have to make a choice. So now I know we need to buy a van, right? We got to find the right van, which is a solution, but we're also concerned about costs, right? Trade-in values, the whole bit, and risk. So when you walk onto the dealer lot, this, this is where your curves are at. This is how you're thinking. Right now, you'll notice finding the right solution. You know you have a need. Finding the right solution, the right van is important, the right car. So now, let's say you narrowed it down to two or three cars. Once you've narrowed it down to two or three options, let's say two options, now, mentally, here's what's happening inside your head. Now you're evaluating. Notice the solution is starting to come down. Why? Because you've pretty much narrowed down your option. But what's happening to risk and cost? And at that point, you're going to make a final decision. And you ever have that situation where you tell the salesperson, hey, can you just go over there? I just need to talk to my spouse for just a minute. And then you're having that conversation. Can we afford it? Is now a good time? I mean, you're not going to lose your job, are you? Do you think your sales will come in? You know, blah, 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 right? And then you finally make a decision. When you make the decision, here's where the curves end up. This is always it. See, what you've got to understand, that we're in sales, and maybe it is about price sometimes, but the majority of times it's about risk mitigation. I'm going to make a decision, but I want to mitigate my risk. How many folks, by a show of hands, have bought something, and they know they could have gotten it cheaper elsewhere, but they really like the person they bought it from, Right? That was all pure risk mitigation. And on that note, I'm going to let you go, but I'll let you go with a positive story, okay? Two farmers, optimistic farmer, pessimistic farmer. Optimistic farmer, one day it's raining. Optimistic ra farmer saying, rain on down, rain on down, let my crops grow. Pessimistic farmer says, rain go away, my crops will dry up, I'll drown, and I'll go broke, broke, broke. 
doesn't like the rain. Next day, beautiful sunny day, totally opposite. Optimistic farmer says, man, shine on down, shine on down, let my crops grow. Pessimistic farmer says, sun go away, my crops will dry up, I'll go broke, broke, broke. You ever meet people that just can't have a good day? You know what I'm talking about, right? So one day, the optimistic farmer gets himself a new hunting dog, decides to go duck hunting out on the lake, right? So the last minute, he invites the pessimistic farmer to come along. Visualize, if you will, boat, middle of the water. Optimistic farmer has his rifle pointed up in the air because he's thinking what? Sooner or later, there's going to be a duck, right? Pessimistic farmer has it laid across his lap because he's thinking, man, it ain't never going to be a duck. Well, sure enough, quack, quack. Optimistic farmer takes one shot, hits the duck, lands about 20 feet from the boat. At that very moment, the optimistic farmer tells his new hunting dog, go get the duck. Man, that dog leaps out of the boat, walks on top of the water, grabs the duck in his mouth, turns around, walks back on top of the water, jumps into the boat, and lays the duck at his master's feet. Man, the optimistic farmer couldn't be happier, couldn't be prouder. Looks over at the pessimistic farmer, says, man, what'd you think of that? Pessimistic farmer says, they stole your money. The dog can't swim. <laughs> What's the rule? Stay away from pessimistic people if you want to be successful. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.